Hello and welcome to my review of The Black Company, the first novel of The Black Company by Glenn Cook. Published in 1984, this launched The Black Company series and Cook's career. I picked this up partly from the recommendation on David Stewart's channel. Um, I don't know David personally or endorse anything you might find over there, but credits where credit's due, I've put a link to his video in the description. If you're interested, you can check it out <clears throat> after my video, obviously. It's interesting, firstly, in that this explicitly calls itself a novel but it reads much more like a collection of short stories, particularly the first three chapters, I'd say, could be read in almost any order as uh, parts of the backstory are recounted, despite the fact that at this early stage are obviously very fresh in the mind. The story is broken up into six chapters of almost identical length, all weighing in about the 50 page mark, which adds further credibility to the short story theory. The seventh and final chapter, being much uh, shorter, serves mainly as a bridge to the inevitable sequels, and there are a further nine books in this series now. But the story follows Croker, a field physician and company historian, and the book supposedly represents the annals of the Black Company. In that regard, it's a little less convincing. Despite some attempts to create an idiomatic style for Croker, it is far too conventional to convince us anything other than a standard homodiegetic narrator. Croker describes himself as sarcastic so often that I did begin to wonder if perhaps Cook wasn't writing in his first language, or perhaps a translator had substituted a word for something that didn't translate quite literally. That is not the case, it's simply an example of the telling not really matching the showing. The example shown here, described on page 269 as a reflex sarcasm, is during a scene later in the book when one of the Taken kills the huge murderous leopard type creature that cost the Black Company its first engagement in the book. This is not sarcasm, reflex or otherwise, but he seems so cute and cuddly. That's sarcasm. The Black Company is a mercenary unit in the first story, Legate, hunted by this monster in a collapsing city-state. They betray and likely murder their employer before taking commission overseas in the kingdom of the despotic lady. Should that be queendom? Quite probably. The next four chapters follow their various victories and introduce what is the book's best, but sadly not completely developed element, the infighting between the mysterious cabal of wizards called the Taken. In my review of Guns of the Moon, I talked about how Stephen Erickson's magic system, helped in part by its beginnings as a role-playing game, is one of that series' better developed and more interesting aspects. Here, the magic alternates between standing in for chemical warfare and squabbling between the company's wizards, Goblin and One-Eye. Despite the string of victories, the Black Company finds itself constantly retreating in a losing campaign. While obviously plausible, this is a tad unusual for a work of fiction where things are simplified somewhat generally. Cook is a military veteran and the right age for this to be an analogy for the muddled Vietnam conflict, but without further research I wouldn't necessarily want to read too much more into that. The book has something of a military following, in part due to its matter-of-fact portrayal of military life and the no-questions-asked attitude of the soldiers of the company. However, it is a strange sort of book. Its anthological structure lends it a somewhat epic feel with huge distances and long passages of time covered by a vast array of characters. However, it is only 318 pages, and the shortness of each entry makes it feel like a snippet from the overall picture. Again, looking at it from a military aspect, this might well be a quite accurate representation of a soldier's feeling of being in control of their aspect of the war, but not having a clear idea of the overall picture. It's interesting in that regard, but the net result is that each chapter feels over in a little bit of a rush and perhaps a touch underdeveloped. However, as a reader, that won't make you feel like you're not getting value for money. There's a lot going on, and much of it is quite interesting. What it, what it does feel somewhat short of, until the sixth chapter anyway, is action. There is very little clashing of sword on sword or any great heroism or daring do. The only battle to be described in any real, de real detail is the siege of the Lady's imposing tower by the rebel forces and it feels somewhat clunky. There is excessive repetition of the words pioneers and mantlets, for example, though synonyms for the latter are an admittedly short supply. This lengthy siege is reminiscent of David Gemmell's legend. The epic scope here, casualties are described in the hundreds of thousands, the manhood of a continent, as Cook describes it, is never quite captured in the prose. It's fairly effective, but it's never particularly exciting. The Black Company is not without its problems. The prose is occasionally repetitive, baffling, and anachronistic to the point of immersion breaking, such as the repeated usage of the colloquial height, references to Hatamad battles and peritonitis. This sentence is not fit to appear in anything professionally published. 
Additionally, the characters sometimes behave in ways that appear inconsistent. For example, after the Hanged Man is injured on page 230, the other members of the Taken leave him to die, knowing that doing so will anger the lady. However, they only kill some of the witnesses. On page 241, while hiding from a pursuing rebel patrol, Goblin and One-Eye give their position away by having one of the numerous wizardly spats, under the circumstances unnecessary and unnecessarily stupid. Later in the book, Croker dreams of raping two children. It seems completely out of character and to rather come out of nowhere. It may be portentous of the fact that the lady has a sister, previously unrevealed, or to the rebel prophecy of a childlike White Rose, who will be present at the downfall of the lady, and is present at the battle both as an imposter and as herself, though unrevealed at this point of the story. Or perhaps it's simply an analogy for what happens to innocent people in times of war. Regardless, it is unnecessary and a little bit seedy. And it also follows hot on the heels of what is probably the stupidest line in the book, uh, page 281, who fears a woman more than a man. Croker writes this in the annals, despite the accepted fact that the lady is cold-hearted and evil, though again this is something we're told more than we're shown. Regardless, to many, she is undoubtedly the most dangerous person in the kingdom. Additionally, the rebels fight on the whim of their White Rose prophecy, which is also a female figure, uh, lending further doubt to the statement. Despite this nitpicking, I would say that overall this comes in as a solid but unspectacular fantasy book. With perhaps another 200 pages, it could have achieved more, but with some authors you are grateful for their brevity. Extra development sometimes just means extra exposition, and as it stands, this is a lean and well-paced story. From the recommendation, I perhaps simply expected too much of it. I'm not really a sequel person, so it's unlikely I'll read further into this series, but perhaps as Cook developed as a writer, some of the issues I've raised will have been ironed out. If you like Gemmel or Ericsson, you may well like this, so it comes with that lukewarm recommendation.